All right, today's message is on Matthew chapter 6. It's going to be verses 11 and 12. It says this, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. We are in the Lord's Prayer. We're in the Lord's Prayer, right? Okay, it's been a while. I, I described, I believe I described two weeks ago, the... The three P's of the Lord's Prayer. Does anyone remember what they are? I don't, I'm not going to be super upset because I barely remembered them and I had to double check myself this morning. I broke the Lord's Prayer down for us into, th uh, into three P's. Praise, provision, perseverance. And so, the praise portion of the Lord's Prayer is the beginning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're praising God. You talk about your relationship. Our Father, we're children of God. Hallowed be your name. His name is holy. And then seeking his kingdom and his will over our own kingdoms and our own wills. And so we praise God at the beginning. And then provision is the second P, which is give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What do we want God to do? We want him to take care of us. We want us to, him to listen to us when we repent and as we uh, forgive others as well. And then perseverance is the final P, which is and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Stay with us, Lord, every day. Every time we come to a trial, we come to a temptation, help us overcome it. Be with us in our future. And so these are the three elements of the prayer, because as I believe I discussed last time, Jesus didn't just say, pray these words. He said, pray like this. And so when we pray, our prayer lives should have these elements of them. We always want to recognize that God is great. We always want to recognize and seek for God to guide us and help us. And we always want God to be with us in our future endeavors. And so regardless of the words we use for the prayers or the specific prayers we lift up, that structure will always keep us grounded. But you might be asking yourselves, maybe you're not, but you might be asking yourselves, but why, why do we have to... Why do we have to remind ourselves every time that God is great, that God is in charge? Why does all of our prayers, can't we just have a second of prayer to be like, Lord, be with this person who's sick? Well, the reason why we always want to recognize why God is great is because that alone influences what we ask for when we pray. Because if we just pray, give us this day our daily bread, then we might be tempted into saying, give us what we want, God, not what you want us to have. And those can be very, very different things. How many have prayed for a new job before and felt like God forsaken you when you didn't get it? Your hands went down. Good, you're learning. But I bet some of you felt that way because I felt that way before. How many have prayed for money before? A house. How many have prayed to get over a sickness? Specifically, like if you're hugging a toilet bowl at the time. Those are some of your most desperate prayers. Every one of those prayer elements that we do always has that temptation to be about us. God, give us what we want. Answer our prayers exactly the way we want it. And that is not how our prayer life should be focused. It should be reversed. God, give me what you want me to have. And if today the only thing you want me to have is a slice of bread, then praise God, thank you, that's what you've given me. And that's a tough prayer life to have because we want things. We like things. We're American. We're capitalist. We want the nicest stuff for the cheapest we possibly can get. Forget about the little Taiwanese boy who's working 75 hours on your new iPhone at 15 cents a dollar. We don't want to pay an extra $35 for it. I was reading something in the news the other day. Apple was looking at actually getting iPhones made in the U.S. 
in two years because they're having such trouble with supply lines because of COVID. Like if you tried to buy an Xbox or a PlayStation, they don't exist right now because the microchips aren't being manufactured in a lot of these countries, so they have a massive supply. So Apple started to explore making them here in the US. The only problem with that was if you got an iPhone that was made in the US, it would be about $4,000, not $600. Because Americans, they want high salaries, which I could say, they deserve. They want health care. They want protections. They don't want to have to work 120 hours a week. They don't want to have to live at the factory and cots in the back. And that's just not how iPhones are made right now. And so when we pray for things, objects and stuff, and we're not praying for what God wants. We pray for money and wealth and a new phone and all of these things. It's not always in line with God's morals. It's not always in line with what God may want for you. And so it's best for you to focus on what God wants you to have, not what you want. And it's easy for me to say this about a new car, even though there's a lot of preachers right now Sunday morning that are standing up here saying, fill up the offering plates, I need a second private jet. The first one's got 1,500 miles on it, can't be having that. There are many preachers out there preaching for money. I won't be one of them. It's not about wealth. It's not about what you have what you don't have, or what your neighbor has. It's about what God desires you to have. God wants to keep you poor? There's a reason for it. If God, if you woke up tomorrow morning and you went to work, and as soon as you walked in, they let you know that your help is no longer needed, and you lost your job, there's a reason for that. It may not seem like it then, but God will put you where he desires you to be. I did not think that I'd be standing in front of a pulpit 10 years ago. Well, 12 years ago. When I got promoted to a manager for Home Depot and moved out to Reno. I had no idea that I would be standing here. But me losing my job out there put me right here right now. And you know, when I was wrestling with this message, like month and a half ago at this point. <clears throat> One person kept jumping up in my mind. Muriel. Because I remember meeting her for the first time at uh, an AIM class. That's why I'm going to be looking at you all the time, John, because she's on my mind right now. That's where she used to sit, if you don't remember. She practically would do like a, a pagan dance for her birthday. It was crazy. Every time we sang happy birthday for it, it was amazing. Um, if it wasn't for Muriel, I wouldn't be here right now. Bert retired. Someone came in to fill the pulpit. To You guys have all been gracious enough not to tell me that experience, but I think if I said mixed results, I would be... Uh, mixed reviews for that individual would be fitting. And she, uh, she said, hey, do you mind filling in for some Sunday? We're just looking for, we're throwing bodies at this pulpit at the moment. She didn't say it like that. She's a lot more colorful with her words. Not colorful like profanity, but colorful like, she's better at words than I am. It's evidenced by me saying this story right now. Um, she said it a lot more elegantly. That's a better way to say that. Um, but I haven't left since that Sunday. I've been here the whole time. And so when she got sick and when it transitioned to the idea that she went from Hope and recovery, and I remember the moment, the weekend that I was with her. She went from hope and recovery to hope and seeing the Lord. You could tell that she was scared. But she knew that she wanted what God wanted for her. And if that meant 
God calling her home, that meant God calling her home. And she had courage, and she had strength, and she humbled me with her thoughts and her attitudes as I was sitting in her living room as she was uh, explaining to me that she had just signed up for hospice. Um, I was almost still in disbelief. I'm like, how? I, I just got here a year ago. God clearly put us here. You were in AIM classes. There was a purpose for this. Why, why are we talking about this right now? You should be recovering and back to school and have a great story. And it just wasn't God's way. And she never once said like, oh, woe is me. I can't believe this. Oh, woe is me. It was like, this is God's plan. It might not be mine. And it wasn't hers. But this is God's plan. And so I'm thankful that I got to be a part of it. And it was amazing. And I'll always remember her, not only for how much she changed my life in such a short amount of time, but when I inevitably come to that moment, because we all will, unless Christ returns now, or soon, if he returns soon, I was wait, giving him a moment. If he wanted an entrance, he could have had it. If Christ comes soon, then we may not have to go through this, but uh, if he's... If it's still not his time, then we'll all go through what she went through. And I'm going to remember her and the strength and the courage that she had. And that will help me do it. And so, when you pray, give us our daily bread. It's not your daily bread. It's his daily bread that you want. And that's hard to do. And it's humbling to do. But that's what Jesus is telling us to. And then the next part of this is, and also for, uh, and forgive us our debts. Forgive us for our mistakes and our errors and our sins. But Jesus connects this with something. Because he says, as we also forgive our debtors. No doubt many of you are holding on holding back forgiveness for someone. You're holding on to anger. You're holding on to pain. And every time you pray this, you have an opportunity to just give it up. And will God take it away all at once? Maybe not. Will you still have those feelings? Absolutely. But moment by moment, the more you say it, the more it will become true. And the the sheer brutality of what Jesus is saying here, the bluntness, I should say, is that if we expect forgiveness from God, then we should be showing it to others. And if we think there's people in our lives that don't deserve our forgiveness because of what they've done, boy, do I have a gospel to tell you. Because you have forgiveness that doesn't deserve to be forgiven in front of God, and he forgives it all the same. You have sinned. You have made mistakes. If I had a mirror up here, I'd be staring right at it because I'm right in your shoes. And so why do we forgive others? Because we were forgiven. Not because they deserve it. Let that be important. Do we deserve God's forgiveness? No, we do not. God has every right to damn us to hell. He could do it if he wanted to. We are not entitled to Jesus Christ simply because we have oxygen in our lungs. People, people feel that way now. They feel like just because they're alive, they're entitled to things. People write whole constitutions about it, that we are entitled with certain inalienable rights. Those rights are solely given by God and have no other anchoring in anything. You were made in God's image, and he chose to love you. There are your rights. How much does he love you? He sent his son to the cross for you so that he took the judgment and the punishment that you deserve. And that's in our prayer all the time. Whenever we do the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. And it's not easy. Definitely wasn't easy for God. But that's the only way to defeat evil in the world. It's to forgive it. It's the only way to combat it. The only way to beat death is with life. 
Breathe life into relationships. Breathe life into joy. Breathe life into forgiveness. It's the only way to prevent it from dying. And so that's provision. We seek what God wants for us. We seek to forgive others so that God, and I don't want to word it that way, it's not so that God will forgive us, because God forgave us. You don't earn your salvation by forgiving others. That's not the street. It's God forgives us so we can forgive other people. That's provision. And you'll do thousands of prayers, hopefully, in the next several months. And they're little two-minute prayers, and they two-second prayers, 30-second prayers. If you're me at a pulpit, it'll be a five-minute prayer. Just kidding. But you'll be doing those prayers all the time and keeping that element of, God, give me what you want me to have. Not what I want, but what you want me to have. And sometimes your prayer could be, Lord, I just applied for this job. I believe this is a great fit for me. Please let me get this job. But Lord, I won't be disappointed if it doesn't work out because you have a plan. And that's okay too. But remember provision with God, focusing on him. Why? Because as we said at the very beginning, it is him who is holy. It is him who is good. It is him who is perfect. Not us. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being such a good God. Thank you for being holy where we are not. Lord, I pray that you're with all of us this week and that we all see clearly your path in front of us. But Lord, if we don't, if that path looks murky, I pray that you put in us a heart of faith and a heart of following you so that we may walk through what we perceive as darkness towards your light, Lord. And I pray that you are with us every step of the way. I pray that you guide our thoughts, our actions, and our minds in every moment. And Lord, I pray that we love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Be with us, Lord, as we wrestle with this week. And let us focus on the blessings that we see throughout it. We love you, God. For we ask this in your name. Amen.